Nubudun, one of Ajahn Mun's most senior disciples, had a famous short explanation of the Four Noble Truths, which he said that the cause of suffering is the mind flowing out. And the path to the end of suffering is the mind knowing the mind. Now, this teaching fits in with what the Buddha taught about asavas, or affluence the things that flow out of the mind and lead us to take rebirth again and again. He said there are three. Sensuality, becoming, and ignorance. And he gave a list of seven ways to abandon them. As I said last night, one of them, paying careful attention to the questions you ask to make sure you don't ask questions that are framed in the terms of becoming, and instead to look at things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. That deals specifically with the effluent of becoming, the effluent of ignorance. Out of the remaining six ways of abandoning the effluence, four of them deal with sensuality. In each case, they're designed to have you become more and more sensitive to what you are doing to create your own suffering. This is the mind knowing the mind. In other words, you don't just stay at awareness, but you stay at awareness and you see how the mind does flow out around the things it likes, the things it doesn't like in the senses. And it's causing itself suffering. When you can see that, then you can begin to stop. The four methods are one. Restraining, two, using, three, tolerating, and four, avoiding. Restraining has to do with restraint of the senses. In other words, you're very careful about how you look at things, how you listen to things, how you, you smell things, taste things, touch things with the body, how you think about things. And be very careful not to let the mind focus on things that would give rise to greed, aversion, and delusion. In other words, you look at the sensory process not as one in which you're simply passive, reacting to things coming in at you. You're out there looking. You're looking for something, and the question is, who's doing the looking? Greed, aversion, or d discernment? You want your discernment to do the looking so they can see things in terms of a causal pattern. And if you look at things with the purpose of trying to find something you like, it's going to aggravate your greed, aggravate your lust. You probably noticed you go through a crowd, and if you're looking for the beautiful people, you'll find them. And it will aggravate your lust, aggravate your greed. But if you go through the same crowd looking for the signs of aging, looking for the signs of suffering on people's faces, you'll find that too. So the question is, you see what you're looking for. So what are you looking for? If you realize that this tendency of flowing out after the senses is a problem, you should be very careful about how you look and who's doing the looking. You want to look in terms of seeing what it is that's going to lead to long-term welfare and happiness. In other words, look for the results of your actions. One, be sensitive to your actions. Two, look for the results of your actions. Then we become more skillful in how you engage in the senses. The same principle applies to using the requisites, which is the second method. We have that reflection on why we eat. What is our purpose in eating? What is our purpose in using clothing, using shelter, using medicine? You want to make sure the purpose is in line with the Dharma, because again, your purpose in using these things is going to have an effect on, on the mind and an effect on the world. You realize that you eat more than you really have to. Okay, you're placing a burden on the environment around you, and you're in debt to the people who provided the food, to the animals that may have been killed in the course of providing the food. 
or if you're a vegetarian, the farmers who had to work really hard out under the hot sun, who see their crops destroyed with the extreme weather we've been having. The more you eat, the more you're placing burdens on others. So you want to be very careful about why you eat, how much you eat. So again, you're sensitive to what you're putting into the process. You're looking at the results. That's what it means for the mind to know the mind. So you can become more and more skillful in your engagement with the requisites of life. As for tolerating, that has to do with painful feelings and hurtful words. And this is one area in particular where we tend to think that we're on the receiving end of bad things. And are not really sensitive to how much we're contributing to the pain around those things. You have to remember the Buddha's teaching on pain. For most of us, we shoot ourselves with arrows. There's the arrow of pain itself, but then we shoot ourselves around the pain with our thoughts of getting upset around the pain, the things we tell ourselves about the pain, the perceptions we have. In other words, the way we fabricate around the pain. And it's that second arrow, the Buddha said, that's the one. It really goes into the heart. The first arrow goes only as far as the body. And we don't see this because we're pulling it in. So as we get more sensitive to the fact that, yes, it's the perceptions you have around the pain, the way you talk to yourself around the pain, that really makes all the difference. Then you start seeing, yes. You're not just on the receiving end. You're the one who's actively shooting yourself. The same with hurtful words. The Buddha has you depersonalize them. Because for most of us, the way we talk to ourselves about the words is, why is that person saying it to me? Why am I being the victim of that person's words? As if we were the only people in the world who were the victims of hurtful words. But as you remind yourself, this is the nature of human speech. There are kind words and unkind words, true and false, helpful, unhelpful. And so when someone is saying unkind, false, and unhelpful things about you or to you, it's nothing out of the ordinary. As John Fuang said to one of his students, you were the one who wanted to get born here in the human world to begin with. This is what they say in the human world, so you've got ears to hear. This is what you're going to hear. When you can think in those terms, it's a lot easier to take the words. Or you can use the perception that Venerable Sarabhuta recommended. An unpleasant sound is make contact at the ear, and just leave it there. Leave it at that. And at this part of the mind, this says, no, there's more want to say about this. Okay, the more you want to say about this, that's going to be the part that's going to be harmful and hurtful. So here again, it's a matter of seeing what you're doing around the pain and the results of what you're doing, so that at the very least you can do it more skillfully. You can apply perceptions to the pain that don't weigh the mind down. See the pain, the body, and your awareness as three separate things. See the pain not as a big block of unending pain, but moments of pain that come, but they're not coming at you. As soon as they appear, they're going away, going away. So in the mind, knowing the mind is not just sitting there watching awareness, it's watching what the awareness is doing, what the mind is doing, and see where it's doing unscuffling. So you become more and more cognizant of how you are shaping your experience, and you've been shaping in such a way, in the way you flow out that creates suffering and leads on to more. Think of King Gauravya. After thinking about aging, illness, and death, Ratabala asks him, if someone were to say there's another kingdom to the east that's weaker than yours. You could conquer it if you wanted to. Would you go for it? And the king, 80 years old, suffering from illnesses, says, yes, of course. 
who are slave to craving. And these exercises help us see how we're volunteering for that slavery. We have the choice of allowing ourselves to be free. As for the fourth exercise, avoiding, the list is strange. You avoid cesspools, you avoid wild bulls, wild dogs, snakes, chasms, things that are obviously dangerous. You also avoid getting into situations with bad friends, bad locations. And this applies to monks specifically, where your friends in the holy life would be suspicious of what you're up to. Places like taverns, brothels. Now the list may mean one of two things. Either it has to do with the tendency that some people have, and they say, well, I'm going to practice total equanimity no matter what happens. I'll just put up with it. There's some things you don't have to put up with if you Tell yourself, I will just walk through the cesspool if I have to. I will walk off the cliff if I have to. That kind of practice doesn't last long. It's just basically being stupid, and at some point you realize it's being stupid. And you just go back to your old ways. The other meaning might be that the Buddha wants you to see that if you hang around with the kind of people who would want to pull you away from the practice, in the sort of situations where you'd be sorely tempted to pull away from the practice. It's as dangerous as a wild dog, dangerous as a wild bull, a snake, a chasm, an open cesspool. So here again, the emphasis is on, is on what are you doing? Why are you putting yourself in danger when you don't have to, especially dangerous to the mind? So these exercises show the meaning of Lumbudun's analysis. The mind flowing out is the cause of suffering, and the mind knowing the mind is the path to the end of suffering. These exercises sensitize you to what the mind is doing, what you are doing, and the results that your choices are giving rise to in the world and in your own experience. So you turn around and look, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? And as I said, we seem to be volunteers for slavery. But we have the choice. We can volunteer to walk the path to the end of slavery. So remember, the practice is not just sitting here with your eyes closed. It's how you engage with your senses, how you engage with your requisites of life, how you deal with the painful things that come at you in such a way that you don't add to the pain, and how you avoid dangers. They're all meant for you to see that you have a choice. You are actively shaping your experience, and so far you've been shaping it in such a way that causes suffering. But there's another way to shape it, by being more sensitive to your input. Now you can bring that suffering to an end. <laughs>